So how are you, Annette? I'm waving to Jamie <laughs> and Mark. Mark's being silly. What else is new? And Larry. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> Can you see Can all these people? people? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, when, when Thank you're... Thank you, uh, Casey. Thank you, honey. Whenever you see me, my hair will always be different. I've been like that from the time I was a teenager. <laughs> I would go to a party or a dance or a record hop and I'd walk in with my hair one way. Partway through the night, it would be another way. And by the end of the night, I'd have it another way. So uh, that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the one who's running the show. So I get to see everybody on the bottom. Nope, <laughs> you guys can't see them. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Hi, Lori. Well, while we're waiting for some people to come on, it is a little after seven and I'm just gonna do a little talking, which I am very good at doing. Um, I love to talk, in case you haven't noticed. We are, um, we can't do praise and worship because of the music being copyrighted. So I, I've mentioned that for the last few weeks now, which is kind of sad. And um, I'm just trying to read that. Okay, well, we will, yeah, we can... Um, pray about that. We're, we will take prayer requests. Now isn't the best time because I'm afraid we'll miss it. But when we ask for prayer requests after communion, if you can type your prayer requests in, in the comment section, you're also welcome to come on the screen uh, for prayer requests and we will pray for you. So either way, it's um, however you want to do that. But as I was saying, we can't um, I do the praise and worship as far as songs go. But I would like, uh, we have like a number of people on right now and there'll be more coming on. I would like you to think because we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. So some of you, all of you should have something to praise God about this week. Something's happened. It could be a little thing that you think is so minute that you can praise God about this week. And I would like to see you putting it in the comment section because this is all part of who we are as believers. God wants us to enter his gates thanking him and praising him. And we're entering his gates right now. So let's type on some things in the comment section about something God has done for you this week. I thank God because my mouth is just about all healed up now. And I am so happy because... As you know, as I said, I love to talk, but now I can talk without it hurting. <laughs> so that's cool. I'm really glad. Annette, you had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner with your family. That's amazing. Some people don't even have families. Yes. That's yeah, good exactly. to hear, honey. I'm so happy you all got together. She has a great family. I know them all. They're really good people. 
Anybody I'm thankful, else? I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, thankful that we have you. this to be able to have our services because without it, we couldn't do this. Exactly. Yes. Hey, Debbie, high five. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is really good. And you found out that Tia is off oxygen for the day, JC. That's wonderful to hear. See, God is good. God is good. His mercy endures forever. You know, it says that so much. If you look that up, you'll see it over and over and over and over again in scripture. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And we need to talk about how good he is. There's some people that just do not understand God at all. And by us giving testimonies and praises and thanking God for something that you think is so tiny could really minister to somebody who's going to come on here and watch it and say, wow, you know, geez, God did that for me too. And I, I never even thought that was a blessing. Right. So whatever you say is wonderful. Lori, you praise God that your nephew survived his heart attack and he's home now knowing God sent an angel to revive him on the side of the road. You know, he must have something special planned for your nephew. Whenever those kind of things happen, the people who are saved from that can either understand it and grab a hold of the hand of God and move in it, or sometimes they just don't do anything. So let's pray for him that he realizes that God saved him for a purpose. Amen. 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 It's so important. Um, I got to ask because I don't think they can comment when they're down there. Mark and Jamie or Larry, do you guys have anything that you want to say? Just put your hand up so I can see you and I'll bring you on screen. I have to be able to see your hand though. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Was that a I yes, Larry? Out. No? Okay. Mark and Jamie? His name is Jimmy. Okay. okay, we will remember Jimmy in prayer that his eyes are opened to God saving him. Hi, Kamal. Hmm. Kamal, we're asking people if they have any testimonies or any praise reports of something wonderful God's done for them this week. And if you have something, just put it in the comment section, please. Type it in there. God is good. So many great things going on out there that we don't even realize. We don't have COVID. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Right. Um, Very good. President Trump is better. That's Did good. See about Trump. that. Yeah, he's been. He's. They said that he's good to go. He's there's. He his body built up. Um. Antibodies against it, and he's he's fine. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, the prayers we've been putting out there for my daughter Lisa. Um, some things didn't turn out exactly the way we would want them to, but God has turned things around for the good. So there's some very good things coming out of something that was not good it was sad but god is putting something good in there see sometimes our prayers aren't always answered exactly the way we want them but only god knows only he knows why certain things happen and the prayers we've been putting out for alicia and aura every week have been really coming through and good things are happening and that's a blessing too Any other praise reports? <clears throat> I have to tell you that people have been contacting me during the week saying that these sessions are really blessing them. And um, they don't always get on like when we're on, but they come on after. 
And also sometimes we don't see that they're on here because they, there's no way that they can comment. They're coming through another avenue, which you know you can't comment on, but they're still part of it. So please make sure all of you who come on on a regular basis and even those who are brand new, share these videos because they're different. And, you know, God shows me that I'm supposed to be preaching on these very um, everyday things that happen in people's lives. So that's what I'm trying to do is bring in things that we can all totally relate to. So we are going to start. We're going to pray. So Debbie, could you pray for the service, please? Yes. Father God, I thank you tonight, Lord, that we are here able to do this service. I ask, Lord God, that you would open everyone's hearts and their eyes and their ears to be able to receive what you're going to say tonight, Lord. I ask that you would speak through my aunt, Lord, that it would be your words that we would be receiving. I ask that you would just bless everybody tonight during this church service and that there would be no interruptions, Lord, that it would just be the way it's supposed to be, Lord, with nothing going wrong. I thank you, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, just want to see. I just got a message. See if somebody's trying to get on here. Hang on. Um, okay, that's something different. Okay. So we, Debbie, we're going to start right off with you reading a scripture. So Colossians 4, 6. Okay. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Okay. So today our topic is hurt people hurt people or why do people hurt me or why do we hurt one another and we're going to take a little bit of a look at why this stuff happens now this is a topic that we could do for a long period of time and we could actually do a counseling session one or two or three or four for each one of us about this, but I'm going to touch on it so we can at least start to understand what this is all about. Hurt people hurt people. There's a book written by that. There's a song that's out there by a secular group called the same thing. People understand that hurt people hurt people. But what does that mean? And why does it happen? So let's take a little bit of a look at that. God says, let your conversation always be full of grace what does that mean the phrase that we maybe not the young young generation that are watching but i think anybody who is 40 and over are going to get this phrase sticks and stones may break my bones but names may never hurt me do you remember that you know, that couldn't be further from the truth than anything. That is so not true. Words can be catastrophic. Words can tear through your heart like a tornado roaring down the street, which, Debbie, by the way, I'm grateful that didn't happen to you. Words can be like a tornado coming in and destroying everything around it. While there may not be visible destruction, the damage to your spirit can be just as devastating as a row of demolished houses from a tornado. It's horrible what can happen. Although the initial sting of hard words is evident, you may be unaware of the lingering effects that words have on us. An overly critical word can leave you with hurt feelings and a very poor self-image. 
being wounded by someone with a bad spirit or critical spirit often changes how you see yourself. And God holds us all accountable for how we use our words, especially the ones that are going to hurt people. An example, when I was a little girl and my grade three teacher, because I couldn't do a somersault, told me that I was useless and that I was never going to amount to anything because I couldn't do a somersault. Really? Do you know those words? Those words stayed with me. For you, you wouldn't believe how long. To this day, sometimes I still have to battle within myself from the words that that person said to me. And, you know, I just thought of something right this very second. Yeah, you know, all my life in marriage, in different situations, I always used to feel threatened by these blonde haired women, these cutesy blonde haired women. You know what? Just as I was talking to you, I realized that teacher who said those horrible things to me was a very attractive blonde haired woman. I wonder if that's why I had that almost fear or insecurity around women that look like that. Wow, I never thought of that one before. That's, a, that's probably what happened. Throughout the book of Job, God is mostly silent, speaking only at the beginning and at the end. But make no mistake about it, he doesn't miss a single word of conversation between Job and his three so-called friends. Never assume that just because God is silent, that he is absent. In the end, he will speak up for you and he will reveal his heart in response to any critical spirit that you know is going on out there. Debbie, do you have Proverbs 22, 11? I do. Okay. One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. Okay, that's in Proverbs 22, 11. And it goes on a little bit. But, you know, has it has the um, king, the king, the king of kings for a friend always. If you love with a pure heart, and here's the second part, and you speak with grace. When we speak with harmful words, just like that teacher did to me, we can destroy a person. God wants us to not only have a heart of love, but grace coming from our mouth. Jesus came to earth. He was clothed in humility to die for us. But he also came to show us the Father in human flesh, right? He did that both by his actions and by his words. Therefore, if we want to know the Father's heart on the subject of hurting people in a critical spirit, we need only to examine the life of Jesus or the way he behaved towards people and what he said to people. See, clearly he confronted sin in people's lives. He wasn't a wimp. You don't have to be like all wishy-washy. But, and I try to tell this to certain people. And if anybody's watching and I tell this to you, you'll know what I'm talking about. You can say something to sinful people. You can say something to someone who's hurting another person or hurting you. But how did Jesus do it? He did it compassionately. Not with a critical or condemning spirit. That's not the way 
of Jesus. He did it as the Father did it, and as he did it then, and he still does it now. Critical words, hurtful words, do not come from a wise heart. Or do they reflect God's heart? When it comes to interacting with others, Jesus wants us to examine our own conduct and our own motives. See, we can interact with people. Sometimes critical, I mean, um, constructive criticism is good. For me in my position, and I have people that I'm training up, sometimes I have to say something to them that might not be exactly what they want to hear. But any of those people will tell you I never do it with a harmful critical spirit because all that does is hurt people. I don't want to be responsible for hurting people. I don't want to be responsible that when that person's 60 years old, they're still remembering a school teacher who hurt their spirit. I don't want to be that person. So if I have something to say, I will try to say it with God's heart. In Matthew 7, 1 to 5, Jesus spoke unforgettable words with unforgettable imagery. Debbie, I think I gave you that to read. It's a bunch of scriptures all together. You want me to read all of them? Yes, please, all at once. Okay. Don't be judgmental or you too will be judged. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Don't judge or you will be judged in the same way and measured by the same standard. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Don't focus on the small faults of others before focusing on your own big faults. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Don't talk to others about their faults while ignoring your own. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. Don't be hypocritical. Correct your own faults first. Then you can correct someone else's faults. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Wow. We could end now. If you fully absorb that, what she just read, God bless you, Debbie, for reading that, and especially the way you read it. If you can just take that message and learn from that message, you will be a better person and you will be serving God and doing what he wants you to do. Let's just review it quickly. Do not judge or you will be judged. Don't judge or you will be judged in the same way and measured by the same standard. Wow. Don't focus on the small faults of others before you take a look at your own faults. And the part where he says, you see, he always talked in parables and stories so people could understand it. Why do you look at that sawdust in your friend's eye when you got this huge plank sticking out of your eye? What's he saying? Why are you looking at their faults when you have faults? Why are you looking at the thing in their eye when your own eye has got this huge thing? Don't talk to others about their faults and ignore your own faults. Don't be hypocritical. Correct your own faults first. Then maybe you can start correcting others. And he even says, you hypocrite. See, God doesn't call names very often. He only says it when it's true. Only he can heal your spirit 
and teach you how to respond to criticism. He wants to enrich your heart with encouragement, both for your good and for the good of all around you. The people who hurt people are not taking a look at what's coming out of their mouth. They're not looking at what their own problems, all they're doing is judging, judging, judging. We're going to do a topic maybe next week on gossip. And you're going to really start to see more of this. You're going to start to understand it even more. Now, that was talking mostly in general. What I just said for the last 10 minutes. Now we're going to look at being hurt in your church. In your fellowship. In your circle. In your bubble. Is the new term that we use now, right? Being hurt by your fellowship is not something that happens once in a while. Did you hear what I said? I didn't say it's something that happens once in a while. I said it's not something that happens once in a while. We often find people who have been deeply wounded, oh my goodness, by the family of God leaving them worn out and totally exhausted. Have you been there? Leaders are sometimes in conflict with each other and with other believers. And they rob the joy that Jesus has promised them. When we examine our own bruised souls, it can make us want to leave our fellowship and even put God on a back burner since what? Since he allowed it. That's what we think. Sadly, we've come to accept that being hurt by the fellowship, our circle, our church, our bubble, we've come to believe that being hurt by them is inevitable. So we either stay away and let our hearts become cold as an ice cube. Or we put on our Sunday best and hope that all the problems will go away. And the pain just gets buried until it gets bumped again. See, this is what's happening with the hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, and hurt people. And it doesn't stop. It just goes on and on and on. Not good. I'm continually amazed at the simplicity of God's word and the direct instructions that he really shares with us. The father's heart towards us, his children, is so open and so loving. He so wisely will instruct us in the way that we are to live. In the midst of all our messes, you know the spot where the rubber meets the road, what they kind of say? God's right there to meet us. The steps that God gives us to live together in unity are simple, though not necessarily easy. That's why we keep hurting each other. They're simple, but we don't know how to do it. Because they're not really easy. Because it feels normal for us to act out against people. There's steps that can help us move from being reactive in conflict to becoming proactive in guarding our hearts and our fellowship. And as steps always do, they will take us to a higher ground where we can live above that strife and above confusion. Love is the framework upon which all of these steps are built. You know me. You know that's what I believe. All we need is love. You think the Beatles wrote that? Jesus wrote that. All we need is love. 
Love is also the handrail that helps us move along from one step to the other step. God says our trademark will be love. John 13.35. Did I give that to you, Deb? Yes. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. As in all things, God wants us to obey him in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our own strength. So John 13, that's a good, good, good scripture. All scriptures are good. But he says, men are going to know that you're my disciples. If you love one another, well, no wonder the enemy wants people to hurt each other. Because how are people going to know God if you're all fighting? Or you're hurt and you back away from everybody. You don't want to even be in the same room with them. How are people going to say, I want what she's got? They're not going to. Here's the first step that I'm going to give you. Remember, I have the notes if you want them. Know your enemy. We don't like to focus on the devil, do we? Most churches don't even speak of this. We don't want to give him glory, do we? Yet, in failing to heed the warning of scripture, that the devil actually does what? Prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may de devour. That's 1 Peter 5, 8. We find ourselves consumed, devoured by all kinds of irritations that we find in one another and in our fellowship. You know, I, I was just saying to uh, somebody the other day that I caught myself. I caught myself. Somebody was making a silly face. I don't know what it was. And I was like, what a dumb face. Why are they making that face? I was getting very critical because they were making a face. Like, that is so wrong. Why was I doing that? See, I was falling into exactly what I'm telling you. Exactly what I'm telling you. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can devour. He'll devour people that even know the word really, really, really well by somebody making a face. <laughs> Why did I let that bother me? Irritations that we find in other people. Or maybe we don't like a leader's personality. Or how somebody's just implemented something new in their program, in their ministry. We complain about a particular style of worship sometimes. Or about people who just don't get it the way we get it. And then we start hurting them. And then they hurt us. If we don't like the way someone worships, if I raise my hands and you don't, and you don't like that I raise my hands, why would you come and try to hurt me because I'm doing that? Or if you don't raise your hands in worship and I do raise my hands in worship, why should I come and tell you that you are not with God because you don't know how to worship? You're right, honey. We need to look inside ourselves before we talk about anyone else. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say here. Being negative robs us of joy and steals our effectiveness as a body. And we're so often oblivious to what is really going on in the spiritual realm. So when we're being negative, and we're hurting everybody around us with our words. We're robbing spiritual blessings. Because even if you don't like an individual person, number one, you're fighting against principalities in dark of darkness. It's usually a spiritual fight. So we have to be careful. That we don't say things that are going to damage and hurt people. It will rob your joy. 
it'll rob your effectiveness of whatever God wants you to be doing. Ephesians 6, 12. Deb, I think I gave you that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That's right. That's what I was just saying. We're not fighting against people. So when we see those kind of things happening and we start mouthing off against people, we need to be careful because it's just the enemy trying to disturb something, something that could be so wonderful because it's going to be good. There's the destructive thing coming at you. And you might say, you know, all of this is like so spiritual to me. I don't even get it or I don't even want to hear it. The more you hear it, the more you will get it and you'll start to understand. And right before you're ready to say something that's going to be harmful, you might be able to stop yourself and think. Is this, you know, the old saying, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That wasn't just a phase, you know. What would he do? When you're in conflict with another believer, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I wrestling against flesh and blood? The answer in these situations, guess what? It's usually yes. And the, the solution is so simple, we usually miss it as Christians or believers, however you want to term this. We must remember that our sole opponent is in the spiritual realm. Satan's mandate is to kill, steal, and destroy. Instead of reminding ourselves of that fact, we put on the gloves and we begin to engage in the battle with one another leaving scratches and scars, bruises and bleeding. It can sometimes take years to heal from those battles. And they always leave a mark. The trademark of love becomes very faint and onlookers can barely see it. Have you ever been in a fellowship where there's so much of that that you don't see the love of God? We recently were just ministering to a wonderful young man and he's struggling with seeing the love of God right now. And if everybody is so cruel to one another, he's never going to see the love of God ever, ever. You got that? He won't see it. Scripture tells us to be alert and to resist the enemy to be on guard, to stand against the schemes of the devil. So when irritation strikes, recognize your true opponent. Know that he has schemes and plans in place. That will at best, it's going to steal from you. And at worst, destroy God's people and their effectiveness. See, when you start hurting people or people start hurting you in the world, as, and then in, in your fellowship, in your church, in your circle, in your bubble, when they start hurting you, what is happening? The effectiveness of whatever it is you're doing or whatever it is God's plan is for you starts to get stolen away and eventually out the window. And we don't want that to happen. Any downward spiral needs to be called what it is. Be alert to the red flags. Our human nature wants to defend and justify ourselves. That's a lot of times why we get mad. And that's a lot of times why we say such hurtful things to one another. God knows our hearts. And our hearts go in our own way, our own flesh hearts. That's why he calls us to pray for our enemies. In Matthew 5, 44, he tells us to pray for our enemies and to do good to those who sp uh, spitefully use us. It's only by trusting the Holy Spirit's power in our lives whenever we feel weak 
or frustrated that we can engage in the true battle that is fought in the spiritual realm and yet lived out in our circle, in our fellowship, in our church, in our bubble. Be alert and always keep on praying. It's so hard. You know, sometimes when marriages are breaking up and there's all the fighting going on, people don't even stop. You know, sometimes they're two believers and they don't even stop to pray together. They just allow all that pain and hurt and terrible words and division to come in. And before you know it, it's over. When if you just would have stopped and asked God to take over, and maybe walked out of the room for a few minutes, went for a walk, came back, tried to talk it over, prayed. Life would be so different. Be alert and always keep praying. When prayer is no longer the breath of our spiritual soul or the heartbeat of our fellowship, our defenses are down. Praying for those who hurt us becomes something we don't even want to do. That's not good. God tells us in his word that we are to pray for those that hurt us. But when they hurt us, we don't want to pray because we're stubborn. Neglecting prayer and Bible reading leaves us open to the enemy and to the conflict. His tactics are so subtle that we can feel so justified in attacking one another. But the loss is to our own hearts and to the kingdom. That's what happens. And it's an unnecessary tragedy. Those things don't have to happen. But we live in a world and we started to become like the world and we don't know how to do anything about it. I don't think enough people talk about it as far as maybe on the pulpit. They don't talk about it too much. The enemy is stealing and robbing is done long before we've recognized that he's at the door. Knowing he's prowling the neighborhood keeps us in a proactive state and that allows us to recognize him and withstand his tactics. But we have to be aware of it. Right? We have to be aware. The Bible often uses images drawn from like uh, agricultural stuff. He, remember I said Jesus likes to talk in parables and the talents and the, and the fields and all that. He often uses seeds and reaping and sowing, right? We always hear about sowing into a ministry and seeds of sowing and they'll reap money. That's not what he's always talking about, so just so you know. Seeds of irritation and annoyance not plucked out and dealt with on a daily basis will grow in your heart. So there is a seed you don't want to have. If every day you allow those seeds to germinate, they will consume. They will take you over and consume. When they're not dealt with, as soon as we recognize them, they'll take root. And each subsequent encounter with that same irritation will always be linked to someone, will cause the root to dig just a little deeper and a little deeper. And the deeper it goes, the more bitter it gets. Scripture tells us that the root of bitterness springs up and defiles many. Hebrews 12, 15, you can look that up. Many, the root of bitterness. And from all the hurt, hurt people, hurting people, who hurt people, who hurt people. The bitterness starts coming a little bit, a little more, a little more, until it's like crazy. That's why Proverbs 4.23 tells us, above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of your life. It's the very source of all that we are. What is in our heart 
and some of you have heard me say this before, what's in our heart spills out of our mouth. And it is by our very words that we often, so sad, grieve the Holy Spirit. The trademark of love vanishes in the sight of the world if we allow that to happen. And we're living in this world that's crazy. And it's not easy to walk around like, la, 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 everything is great. I forgive you and you forgive me and we're all good. That's not easy. We need to guard our hearts and take stock every day. Holiness is really just truth in your inner parts. We need to keep short accounts for our own heart's sake. In fact, the Bible tells us not even to keep account of all these things that are done against you. That's the best thing to do, not to keep accounts. He wants us to forgive, let go, and move on. And the root of anger or bitterness is only just the beginning in your own heart and is still undetected by others. Go to God and ask him to remove it. Ask for grace to be poured out in your heart so that you'll be able to deal with that particular situation and that person, not in your own strength. You can't do it in the spirit's strength. Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work and all things, at all times, through the Spirit, we can do this. We can do this, friends, through the Spirit. If the root has already spilled out and hurt other people, guess what we have to do? Go and confess your sin to them. Even if they don't receive you or they don't own their part in the conflict, keep your own heart guarded and clean. You are only responsible for you. You are responsible for your heart, your own heart. Dealing with unresolved conflict in someone else's heart, that's God's job. So if you have already started hurting people with your mouth, maybe it's good if you can remember who it was that you were hurting, that you can do something. Tell them you're sorry. Tell them you realize it was wrong. Throughout my life in ministry, and I have told this to others that know me, I have had a lot of people say a lot of horrible things about me. Some of you on here might have heard some of the horrible things, things that are so far-fetched from who I am, things that I would never, ever have thought of doing. If I've done something wrong, I will be the first to come and tell you. I will admit it. I've asked people to forgive me. I've done all kinds of stuff. But some of the things people say about me, oh my goodness. It's horrible. Why are they trying to hurt me? Well, because now I've come to realize like sometimes it's people who don't even know me, people who are on a board of directors at a place where I worked, where those people didn't even know me. And they're saying these things that are totally untrue. But why? Because you see, God has a plan. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. And if the devil can get you down and get you so hurt, and destroyed by words that came from somebody else's mouth and they blabbed to everybody else. And next thing you know, all the negative seeds are planted and the weeds are growing and you're the victim. See, God doesn't want that. He does not want that. It's a root that has grown inside. It's spilled out and it's hurting people. And those people who said those things, it was spilling out and hurting me. But you know what? I had to finally look at that person and realize I'm not fighting against flesh and blood. It's something in the spiritual realm 
that's trying to get me down, so I'll stop doing all I'm doing. And when I can realize that, I can come out of it. Some people don't know how to come out of it. They get deeply depressed. And that's where we need to deal with them in that issue and help them to come out of it. The spirit calls us to manifest his fruit, not the works of the flesh. Evaluate the fruit that's in your life. The fruit gives us a way. If you have confessed to your part in a conflict, you've said something, you've hurt somebody, and others refuse to do the same thing, give them grace, pray for them, and if necessary, distract yourself from the overflow of the bitter roots until they allow God to heal their hearts. Some of my sisters and brothers watching this right now and who will be watching it, you know, maybe you've been divorced and it was maybe a bitter divorce. And maybe that person won't accept you talking to them. Pray for them. You don't need that bitterness. Maybe you couldn't make it together. Maybe they were abusive. Maybe you were abusive. I don't know what went on. But pray for that person. And then let it go. Don't say any more. And move on. We used to have, before all this happened, our fellowship in the house. A couple years ago, People would come in, you know, they'd hear about our fellowship and that there was a lot of love here and they'd want to come in and be part of it. And sometimes people would walk in that front door. And as soon as they got, they weren't even up the little stairs to come into the living room area. They started cutting down the pastor of the church where they just came out of. I would stop them in their spot. I would say to them, number one, you don't talk against God's anointed. You may not know, uh, you. I may not know them, or I may know them really well. They may not be the way you think they should be, but they're still serving God. Keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about any minister when you walk into this house. If you're led to do that, I would appreciate it if you don't come in. And that's what I used to do. It had to be done. We can't allow that to go on. If you're in the midst of people hurting people, if you have any way at all to stop them, do it. Don't allow them. We were just at something the other day, and they were talking against somebody who I respect highly. And I was listening to it all, and finally, it was hurting me to hear what they were saying and hurting that person's reputation. And that person, and I just said, you know what? I got to I gotta say something right now. And I did. I said what I believe God led me to say. If they received it, they received it. If they didn't receive it, they didn't receive it. But I knew that I did what God wanted me to do. And that's where we come in when we know people are hurting people are hurting people. If there's any way whatsoever that we can gently talk to them out of compassion, but firmness, that's what God wants us to do. We need to um, be alert to the seeds that are in our own house, in our own house, in our own heart, and our house. That probably was not a slip. It was probably true. They are eventually producing fruit of one kind or another. So whatever seeds we have going on in our house, Sometimes the people you think are so holy have horrible seeds in their house. You walk in their house and you're in there for a few minutes. You're like, get me out of here. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. That's Galatians 5.22. Ask yourself, is this spiritual fruit in short supply in my life right now? If it is, 
invite the spirit to show you any bitter seeds that have begun to take root in your heart. You need to stop hurting people. See, people hurt you. I know they do. I know they do. People hurt me. But we also hurt people. So, and, and for us to say we don't ever hurt anybody, that's kind of prideful because we do. So we need to look. Are those fruits evident in our life? If they're not real evident, work on it. Is love really evident in your life? Do you love people? Do you really love people? Or do you look down on people? Are you rude to people? Do you judge people? What did he say about judging? Oh my goodness. So it's 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 a sermon in itself about judging. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with our whole heart and lean not on our own understanding. It exhorts us to acknowledge him in all our ways and promises that he will make our path straight. If your way of thinking is resulting in opinions and actions that bring disunity, ask God to reveal to you what in the world is going on in your heart. God speaks harshly about the ones who promote division. Titus 3.10. Did I give you that, Deb? I might not have. Um, no. Okay, because I was just making mention of it. If the spirit prompts you to speak to someone who's causing conflict, remember to do it in love and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you have to go talk to somebody that you know is causing conflict, you know somebody is hurting other people, pray first. Ask for the spirit of God to come with you and to speak through you. Don't be afraid to hold people accountable or to be held accountable. God is sovereign and he is the great redeemer. So no matter how bad the situation is, if he's invited in at any point, he will come in and he will redeem the situation. Work things out for the good and his glory and put that train that was derailing back on the track. In Chronicles 2, 7, 14, it says, did I give you that, Debbie? Chronicles 2, 7, 14. Yes. Okay. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked, selfish ways, then I will heal their land, their church, and their heart. It's a promise. You know, we've been using this. I've been using it. We used it when we had our little session on the end times, which, by the way, we're going to have some more if you if you were really interested in that. But it, it applies to every part of our life. So if we'll humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, one of our wicked ways is a selfish way, and it's hurting people. They hurt us. We hurt them. They hurt us more. We hurt them more. Oh, yeah. You want to fight? They hit you in the face. You go back and you hit them twice. Is that God? I don't think so. God resists or opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I know I gave that to you to read, Debbie, but I got it. Pride is a killer. It's one of the subtlest tools of the devil. God actually resists the proud. And who would want to be opposed by God? Would you? I wouldn't. Yet we often find pride in our fellowships. Although it wears a different cloak or coat or gown than it does in the world. But it's still there. Pride exists in our hearts and in our churches and in our fellowships in a couple of ways. I'm going to mention them. When we stand by our righteous principles, but we walk away from reconciliation. 
I've seen this often in ministry and in pastoring. Taking a stand is not wrong in itself. However, it's often accompanied by the lack of grace and the spiritual superiority that prevents the spirit of God from working in a situation. If you are ever tempted to stand for righteousness against another Christian, check to see if your trademark is love. And is it visible? Make sure your heart is clean in all the places secret in your heart and ensure that you have done all you can to live in peace with that individual. If the basis for your stand is your pride, be very careful for God does resist the proud and you don't want him to resist you. So if you're going to be coming against somebody and, and it's, it's a brother or sister in the Lord, check yourself. All these things I just said to you, make sure that your heart is clean. Make sure that you've tried to live in peace and make sure you're doing this in love because you care about the person. And you don't want this to go on anymore. doesn't mean you have to get together and la la, be happy together and, you know, happy together. You know, that doesn't have to be. You just don't want to keep hurting people and have people hurting you. And in turn, you all start hurting other people. We want it to end. When we speak from a sense of spiritual pride, you may have a discerning heart or sometimes a prophetic gift. And God might reveal truth to you concerning a certain situation or a certain person. Okay, God might say, yeah, that person, be careful, not right. But be very careful. God calls us first to prayer and often to do nothing more. That's a hard one to swallow. When you want to go out there and you want to fight it. He might just want you to pray. God will clearly reveal whether you should be saying anything. But the first task is to obey him by praying. A lot of damage has been done in the church or in your fellowship or in your family. When someone feels they've received a word from God but hasn't prayed about it. If you think you sense something, pray that God will reveal it. If there's anything else he requires of you to do. God's whisper in our spirit will never be in conflict with what his direct word says, ever. He doesn't conflict with himself. When we live out of spiritual pride, the spirit becomes grieved. We don't want to grieve God's spirit. We're cut off from what God wants us to do in our lives and in that situation. 1 Corinthians 13. Did I give that to you, Debbie? Yes. Please read it. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, you didn't. I'm sorry. I thought I, thought I had it, but I don't. Okay. Uh, the simple question to ask before opening your mouth, though, is will this lift Jesus higher or is it going to lift me higher? So when you're going to deal with a situation where people are hurting people and you're going to bring it out into the open, is it going to lift Jesus up or is it going to lift you up? Are you doing it for God and so that everybody can be at peace or are you doing it because you want your way and you want to prove you're right? Ephesians 4.29, did I give you that one, Deb? I'm sorry, I gave you a bunch at the end and I wasn't sure. Yes, I have that. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, be slow to speak, especially words that show negativity, and be quick to listen. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. See, so he's telling us right there, if we do all of that, if we have a wholesome talk coming out of our mouth 
and and it's not helpful for building up people and their needs, then it says we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We don't want to ever grieve the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Yes, it is. James 3, 3 to 17 talks about two kinds of wisdom. One that doesn't come from heaven and one that does come from heaven. The first kind of wisdom is centered on earthly, unspiritual values with envy and selfish ambition at its core. And the trademark of love is not there. The wisdom that's based on heavenly values will be pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, and full of mercy and good fruit. It will be impartial and sincere. So the higher value system can be attained by applying love. Love that comes from the heart of the Father and fills your heart. Then the world's going to see your trademark and glorify our Father who's in heaven. We need to tender our hearts and tend to them wisely. The state of our soul, the health of our fellowship, and the watching world depends on how we handle all of what I just talked about. Hurt people, hurt people. Can we try to help stop that? Yes, we can. In Psalm 133, verse 1, I'm going to end it with this. God says this. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Wow. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's what he wants from us. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God wants us to be in unity. And we can do it. We can stop right here. I can stop. You can stop. You can stop hurting people. And when someone hurts you, we just talked about the things that we can do to stop it. Amen? I'm just going to pray for you quickly. We're going to have communion. We're going to have prayer requests. Father God, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you've taught me through this word. I love when you do that, Lord. I love when your spirit is the one that speaks and I learn. And I pray, Lord, that the words that came from my mouth will be teaching those who are on here tonight and those who are planning to watch at another time, that they will learn what it's all about, is people hurting people, hurting people, hurting people. Help us to apply your principles. Help us to have the trademark of love through everything that we do. All we need is love. I know sometimes, God, that that sounds cliche. But it's your way of life. It's Jesus' way of life. And that way of life, help us, oh God, to apply it to everything we do every day of our life. Thank you for giving us life and thank you for giving us opportunity to learn and to grow and to help change things in our world. Bless us all tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to do communion. And I've asked Larry to come on and he's going to pray for the bread. 
And I am going to pray for the wine. So what we're going to do is every week we do communion because Jesus said to. He said, whenever you come together and you eat and you drink, do this in remembrance of me. Larry, can you please do the bread? As you said, when Jesus and the disciples were there at Passover, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is to represent my body, which will be broken for you. And every time that you have this, do it in remembrance of me as you eat the bread. And they all took pieces of bread, broke it, and ate it. And as they came together that night, they had the regular thing. They had bread, they had wine at the table, and they would always drink together and eat together. But Jesus said to them, tonight, when you drink this wine, you do this in remembrance of me, because all of my blood is going to be poured out for you. And you may not understand right now, but you will for the sins that you have committed. I will be pouring my blood out for you. And every time you drink this, remember this. So let's drink our drink right now. Take a second to remember what he did for you. Now, I would like to um, ask you, we've got a few prayer requests written down. I would like more prayer requests. If you have them, please come on and write down your comments in the comment section. If we could bring up Debbie and Mark and Jamie and Kamal. Well, it was the wrong way. If you have any phones on, please turn them off or mute them. Right now, we're going to pray for Jimmy, who uh, that he would open his eyes, that the accident, car accident, that or the accident that he was in, that his life was saved and he could have been snuffed out and that he will realize that God saved him for a purpose. So his name is Jimmy. We're going to pray for Tanya and Charity. Um, it's a mother and a daughter. She asked me to have prayer for them. That She has not seen her daughter for quite some time. She's only a teenager. She misses her and loves her. So she would like prayer for them. Charity is the daughter. Tanya is the mother. Pray for Michael Melendez. Um, he's not really good, but he might be a little better than he was. I talked to him. He couldn't speak, really. But apparently he's better than he was. So let's continue to pray for him. Annette wants prayer for her back, please. Please um, bring your prayer requests on to the chat area. Anyone have prayer requests, please put them up here.
Okay, so Jimmy, it was a heart attack, not a car accident. He was saved from a heart attack. Okay, so a young girl, a girl having triple bypass surgery, 90% blockage. Anyone else? Uh, how about for Tia and the transplant? She's on a list and her brother is testing to see if he's available. How about if we pray for Tia? That she'll have the right person for her transplant. If it's her brother, whoever it is. Anyone else, please? For those who tune in later, I know a lot of you do that. Um, if you have a prayer request, please put it on the page or also let us know, write to one of us individually and you will be put onto the prayer list and we will be praying for you. Anyone else? Oh dear. Okay. Well, if you have something else, put it on. Right now, we've got Jimmy, Charity and Tanya, Miguel, Annette, and the person who's having bypass surgery, and Tia for her transplant. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six of us here on. How about if Debbie, um, can you pray for Jimmy? He's the fellow that had the heart attack, that he will realize God saved him for a reason. Um, Larry, if you can pray for Tanya and Charity, mother and daughter that need to be reunited again. Uh, Mark and Jamie, can you pray for Miguel? Michael, whatever, um, for his health. Uh, Camus, could you pray for um, Annette's back? And um, I will pray for the bypass surgery for this girl. And also I'll pray for Tia. I realize there's one extra person. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's begin. So we'll just start with the order that I said and just start praying. <clears throat> Father God, I pray for Jimmy right now, Lord. I just pray that you would open his eyes. Let him realize, Lord, that he's here for a reason, that you kept him here for a reason, Lord, and that this person who helped him on the side of the road, Lord, that 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 was that was an angel helping him, Lord, that you saved him. You have him here. Let him open his eyes and open his heart, Lord, and let him come to you. I just pray, Heavenly Father. Some sometimes it takes time, Lord, but I just pray that he would realize this. Let him realize this. You saved him. He's here for a reason. There's a purpose in his life, Lord, and I pray that his eyes would be open to that in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Larry, can you pray for um, Charity and Tanya? Father, we lift Charity and Tanya up to you, Lord. Lord, we know that there is no reason that a mother and child should be apart for any length of time. Father, we ask for renewed 
love between them. We ask that charity reaches. We ask that you touch charity and bring charity to the realization that she needs her mother to be with her. And Father, we thank you because we know that the love between a parent and a child is like the love of you with us. So Father, we ask that you renew that love between them and set them set them right with you and with each other. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I'm praying for healing on Michael. Lord, is fill his heart, Father God. Lord, is renew it, Father God. Renew his body, Father God. 100%, Father God. You save him, Father God. Do your will. Lord, is heal his body. Thank you for having him be part of us, Father God. Lord, we give you praise and honor. Good thing. Amen. Our Lord and our healer, Jesus Christ, Arnett's back is aching. We don't know why, and we don't even need to know why. What we know is that you are our healer, and if you stretch your hand, on that back, it will be well and kicking again. Father, we pray that we shall hear of a testimony of an instant miracle that you performed after this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, we pray for this uh, woman who's having bypass surgery with 90% block. That's a lot. And we just ask you, God, because you are the great physician, that you can go in there and unblock those arteries, unblock everything that's causing all these trouble, and that your hands, your angel's hands will be there uh, in the midst of the surgery, and that she will come out. In, in fantastic shape and be giving glory to you, Lord, that we can all say, you know, we serve a mighty God and that you've healed her. And we think about Tia and that transplant that she has. If it's her brother that's going to be the donor, then that's wonderful. If not, Lord, that you will provide the right person for her and that she can get this done soon, very quickly, so that she can be well and healthy. And we look forward to hearing the, the um, praise report about that. And, and I just got a request now for a pastor's little baby named, um, I think it's Isis. And it's a new little baby just born, very sick. Father, we don't know why that happens, but we ask you, Lord, to put your miraculous hand on this newborn baby. It's a pastor, Lord. It's his baby. He's crying out to you to heal his child. And we ask you, Father, to hear the cries of his people. And, and to, Lord, that you'll hear our cries. And that you will touch this child and heal this child. And, and raise this child up to be a mighty person of God. That it'll be amazing the work that he's going to do in this world. And we thank you, Father, for all these prayers. I ask you to touch everybody that's on here. And lead the ones that couldn't come on somehow to listen to this father so that they can learn to not hurt others and understand why people hurt them we thank you father we thank you so much for all that you're doing in our lives we give you praise and honor and glory in jesus name amen amen um before we close i am going to ask debbie to say a little bit here um in regard to those who don't know Jesus. But I wanted to just um, mention that for those who come out to the Monday night class, um, it's it's a good class. We're doing part two. If you missed part one, it's on YouTube. You can watch it. And it is about uh, the egg and the human. Are we the same? 
and it's basically this week we're going to be talking about the spirit, uh, the body, the spirit, the soul, and the body. No, we're going to talk about the mind now and how the mind gets involved in all three of those parts. So it's very interesting. It'll be good. It's going to be at seven o'clock instead of six <coughs> central, uh, central. Whoa, Eastern Standard Time. It's it's going to be at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time because, as I said, it's Thanksgiving in Canada, and I've got to see family. So <coughs> seven o'clock on Zoom. The link is on um, my Facebook page, so you can go onto it. The other thing is on. Um, very soon, the 29th of this month, we are having ordination services. Um, Debbie will be ordained and Mark and Jamie. And we are inviting every one of you to attend. We would love for you to attend. You don't have to pack your bags. You don't have to go far except for in front of your computer. And you will be able to watch the ordination. It's very beautiful. And um, they have worked hard to get to this point. And we would like to have as many people as possible. So if you can put that on your calendar. And what time did we say? 6.30. Anybody remember? 7 o'clock Eastern time. I'm looking. 7.30. 7.30 Eastern. Yes. Eastern Standard Time. Yes. So you're welcome to come on and watch. And if you are personally interested in being ordained into this ministry, <clears throat> then get in touch with us and we will uh, guide you in the right direction of what you have to do. All right. So, Debbie, if you want to finish with what you want on your heart and then end our prayer for the night. Okay. Uh, for anyone who is coming on to watch if you do not know the Lord um, you're missing out <laughs> you're missing out on a lot of blessings and joy and peace and happiness and I invite you to please you acknowledge you need to acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner we're all born into sin no none of us are perfect you need to believe that God sent Jesus down here on earth to walk as a human he came down here shed all his blood for us so that we could be forgiven he died and he rose three days later and is alive now and he is coming back so what we need to do is we need to say a little prayer just you can say it if you want to say it the way I'm going to say it, or you can say it in your own way, but you just have to mean it in your heart. Just Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I come to you now and I ask that you would please forgive me of these sins. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to become more like you. I believe, Lord, I believe, and I know that you will save me. All you have to do is say, say these words and believe it in your heart and you will be saved. You will be a believer and you will experience what, what we experience. And I only wish that for you guys. And I would like to right now, I'm going to pray. Is it, should I just pray and close this out? Yes, please. Okay. I thank all of you for joining us this evening, and I would like to bless all of you guys. I ask God right now to pour his blessings out on everybody right now. I ask that you would pour your Holy Spirit out on everybody, give them joy, give them peace, give them comfort. And I ask, Lord God, for blessings on this ministry so that we can continue to do what we're doing. And I ask, Lord, for blessings on each and every person and part of this ministry that as we are going in our own direction after we leave here, that we will continue to do your work for the ministry to bring people to you and to bring people to help the children. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So love you all. God bless you. 
please share this on your Facebook page, Instagram, whatever. And so people can watch it. And um, yeah, have a good week. Okay. And we'll see you maybe tomorrow, I hope. Otherwise, sometime during the week. See you guys soon. Love you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.